Hello and welcome to Understanding Poverty, a Behavioral Economics Approach. I'm your host, Andy King. I'm a training specialist for the VISTA program with the Corporation for National and Community Service in Washington, D.C. I'll be providing support during the session, uh, both in the chat and the Q&A, uh, and then later on, I'll be back to facilitate the Q&A session. I have the happy privilege to introduce our main presenter, Dr. Ben Castleman is an Associate Professor of Education Policy at the University of Virginia. Ben's research applies insights from behavioral economics and social psychology to improve college access and success for low-income and non-traditional students. Ben is the author of several books, including the forthcoming book, The 160-Character Solution, How Text Messages and Other Behavioral Strategies can improve education. Ben has presented about his research at the White House Summit on Expanding College Opportunity and in testimony before Congress. Ben is also an AmeriCorps alum, having served two AmeriCorps terms in Rhode Island. We're also joined today by Bethany DeSoblin and Scott Weinrobe from Education Northwest, who will be monitoring the Q&A and chat panels with us and helping to get your questions answered. Our producer today is Sam Graziani from JBS International. Here's what we hope you'll get out of today's webinar. We hope that you'll be able to identify the factors that influence our ability to make informed decisions and then understand why people in general often struggle in the face of complex decisions. You'll be able to describe some common responses that people have when faced with complex decisions or complicated information. You'll be able to explain how scarcity in a variety of forms, financial or cognitive, can inhibit our ability to make informed decisions. And you'll leave this session ready to describe concrete solutions that address these behavioral obstacles and that can aid people in poverty with decision making. We'll start this session with an intuitive overview of how people make decisions. Then we'll take a look at factors that can inhibit informed decision making. From there, we'll provide an overview of strategies to support more informed decisions and discuss how these strategies could address common challenges that confront the poor. And then we'll take a look and see what questions you have. Now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Ben Castleman. Ben? Thanks very much, Andy, uh, and thank everyone of the attendees for being here and participating in today's webinar. I'm very excited to interact with you over the next hour and a half or so. Now, I imagine some of you enthusiastically signed up for this webinar a few weeks ago, but once today arrived, you felt the pinch of having a bunch of other tasks that you had to get done. If that's the case for you, no need to worry. This tendency to want to do things when they're a bit far off in the future, but to feel more reluctant when the time actually arrives, is one of the common behavioral responses we'll discuss on this webinar. Now, on to some other common behavioral responses. At some time or another, every one of us confronts complex tasks and decisions. As a way of getting you all involved in the webinar, I'd like you to think for a moment about a complex task you've had to complete in the recent past or have coming up in the near future. Maybe a big report you had to write or a grant proposal you had to complete. Let's start with a chat question. How do you approach planning to complete complex tasks like a big report in advance of when they're due? For example, one thing I do is try to block out chunks of time in my calendar a few weeks before the deadline when I can work on the task. Take a moment to share some of the strategies that you use. And to do so, please enter your ideas in the chat box and make sure you send your response to all participants. All right, so we've got lots of strategies coming in here. Um, uh, several of them focus on breaking down the task into subtasks or um, you know, more attainable bits. Um, getting help from other people, uh, so enlisting in, in others and, and pulling in other, um, other talents and, and hands to, to make the work a little bit easier. Um, To-do lists. To-do lists show up a lot and uh, color-coded 
uh, lists can help you categorize uh, work in a lot of different ways. Uh, timelines, schedules, uh, setting aside time. Um, so we can see there are a lot of common threads here in, uh, in some of the responses. Great. Uh, thanks for sharing some of those, Andy, and thank you all. I think the, the speed and volume of your responses indicates that you all, like many of us, um, try to be very planful and intentional uh, in anticipating tasks we have coming up and in creating plans to get those tasks done. I, my favorite, I have to say, is someone chatted, I saw as it was going by, asking my wife for help. Um, and this is a strategy that I should try more often. I'm sure I would, I would be much more productive if, if I did that. Now, a follow-up question. Many of us, certainly myself, find that even the best laid plans can go awry. So thinking back on that, on a big project you had that wound up being harder to complete than you might have originally anticipated, take a moment to think about what types of obstacles arose that made it difficult to complete the project. And again, um, please share some of these obstacles in the chat box and, and make sure you send your response to all participants. Uh, so the, the typical nemesis, computer crashes, illness and injury, um, oh, one of mine, forgetfulness, that uh, if I didn't write it down, it slips out of my mind. Um, so, uh, yeah, forgetting or losing track of time. Other obstacles, uh, lack of resources or lack of cooperation, um, an unexpectedly complex task. Uh, my own procrastination. So there's a, it seems like even a wider variety of obstacles here um, than, uh, than what we saw earlier. Great, and I, I really appreciate you, you highlighting those examples, and again, to the participants for sharing, sharing what arises. I think um, the, the few that Andy called out draw an important distinction. Sometimes um, obstacles arise either when we're trying to complete a complex task or in the course of our daily lives um, that are really outside of our control, an illness, an injury, a family emergency that we can't anticipate when they're going to happen and we really can't do anything about. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's a reality that we all confront. What's interesting to me is another set of the responses are um, tendencies that maybe uh, for some of us are recurring challenges. So, um, maybe not having a fully formulated to-do list, a tendency to be forgetful, a tendency to procrastinate. And it's that latter type of response that I'm really going to focus on today, the ones that um, we might see ourselves doing with some repetition and that with some additional awareness and concrete strategies, we can um, address and help ourselves be more productive, but also help um, the people with whom we work make more active and informed decisions and be better able to, to navigate the complex tasks and decisions that they face. Um, so we're going we're gonna to transition now. Thank you very much for, for sharing um, up, up until now in these, these prior two chats, and we'll certainly have more opportunities going forward. The challenges that some of you shared and that people in general face completing complex tasks is the focus of much of my research, and, and to be quite honest, something that I wrestle with personally a lot. As a very concrete example, this past spring I was working on a book on behavioral economics and education. You can see the cover um, over to the right-hand part of your slide. And I did, I think, all the right things planning-wise. I set aside big chunks of time each week to work on it well before the draft was due to my editors as one example. But when each block arrived, each time block arrived, it had somehow gotten at least 50% smaller than I intended. I wound up uh, carving out portions of each block for pressing calls and meetings. And even within the time I set aside, I was constantly pulled away from writing by the steady stream of email and Twitter notifications constantly appearing on my screen. Now, the irony, of course, which I'm well aware of, is that I was writing a book about behavioral economics and knew full well to avoid these kinds of distractions. But I personally lacked the willpower to turn off the notifications. The allure of new information was just too tempting for me. Now, I wound up getting the book done, and, and hopefully it's of, it's of decent quality, but it probably would have been less stressful if I'd managed to be more disciplined about my time and been able to avoid the temptation of new updates to my Twitter feed. The few minutes we've spent just now discussing how we approach complex tasks illustrates a variety of common behavioral issues we'll discuss during the rest of the webinar. 
One, the commitments we make for ourselves in the future often come in conflict with our present impulses and desires. Two, distractions make it hard to devote as much time as we want to completing a task. And three, we're sometimes overly optimistic about our ability to complete tasks and don't always set aside the time required. Before discussing these responses in more detail, I want to take a brief dive into the neurology of decision making. And the goal here is just to give you a very intuitive, high-level sense of how our brain processes decision, how our brains process decisions we confront every day. And to, to describe this, I want you to think uh, with an analogy in mind. Think of the brain as being covered by two interconnected systems. One part of your brain is the accelerator. This is the part that responds to immediate stimuli and impulses. So 10,000 years ago when we were wandering around on the plains and a saber-toothed tiger came out on the horizon, this was the part of the brain that said run, find shelter. Another part of our brain you could think of is the brake. This is the part of our brains that's responsible for logical analysis, careful deliberations, and conscious reflection. This is the part of the brain, let's say, when we're considering different medical procedures for a loved one, that we want to really carefully consider our options and the benefits and costs of different procedures, talk to physicians, talk to other people, and make as informed a decision as possible. We're on to the next slide at this point. Great, thank you. Now, our traditional view of decision-making is that our logical system has full reign. This really comes in large part from the field of economics, which historically has assumed that when people make decisions, they impartially assess the benefits and costs of various options and choose the option that maximizes the benefits relative to the cost. In reality, however, our impulsive systems often exert strong influences on our decisions. After all, our logical systems are the parts of our brains that tell us that we should exercise more because the health benefits outweigh the costs. And those costs might be money to pay for a gym membership, uh, time to devote to exercise, or if you're like me, the sheer physical discomfort that running um, a few mornings each week entails. But this logical analysis still doesn't stop our impulsive side from hitting the snooze button rather than get up and go running in the morning. In the next few slides, I'll give you a brief overview of some common ways that our impulsive systems can get in the way of our best intentions or prevent us from making informed choices. One, our present impulses often come in conflict with the longer-term goals we've set for ourselves. Two, when faced with complex information or complicated choices, we often use simplifying strategies to make decisions. Three, our decisions are often guided as much, if not more, by emotional attachment as by logical analysis. And four, we have a strong tendency to stick with the status quo rather than make an active choice. Now, we'll start the conversation by discussing the tension between future goals we set for ourselves and impulses that can get in the way of reaching these goals. As a starting point, and again, to hopefully keep you as an audience engaged throughout the webinar, I'm hoping you'd be willing to share a goal, personal or professional, that you've set for yourself within the last six months. And note that six months back includes New Year's resolutions. For instance, I made the goal this year to finally stop biting my nails. What goals have you set for yourself? And again, as always, please enter your ideas in the chat box and make sure you send to all participants. All right, <clears throat> we've got lots of uh... Lots of goals and ambitions and resolutions here. Some of it's around finances, um, paying off bills and credit cards, managing money a little bit more. Uh, lots of them around uh, exercise and uh, some personal professional development things around learning languages, um, taking the GRE, um, uh, going to grad school. Some of it, um, you know, more health related around uh, eating better, stopping uh, eating meat, reducing coffee, uh, better exercise, biking to work, all of that kind of uh, stuff. And then um, ah, one of them was joining Vista. So that's a, a goal that we see has been realized. So wide variety here, Ben. Great. Thanks so much for sharing that. And, and again, it's, it's such a pleasure for me to, one, be able to pause for a moment to catch my breath, and two, 
um, read such a such a rich diversity of, of goals and aspirations. Um, I, 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 as you said, Andy, I saw such a such a wide range. So it's really it's really great to see. Now I imagine I'm not alone in struggling fo uh, to follow through on on, the, on these goals uh, that I set, and, and I imagine um, some of you um, over the last few months may have a hard time have had hard time. Uh, following through on the intentions that you've established. Some of us who plan to exercise more probably had trouble fitting the exercise in, or if you're like me, um, not hitting the snooze and, and going back to bed in the morning. Other of us, others of us who plan to spend more time with family probably had something come at, at work that we felt we had to get done. Almost all of us uh, have had the experience of conflict between our future and present selves. And you could think of this really as a tug of war between our brain's two systems. Our planful or logical system is good about making long-term plans and goals that we know are in our best interest, like eating more salad. Our impulsive self has a hard time in the moment saying no to things that we crave. The for-profit sector exploits this all the time. Take Chili's Restaurants, for instance, which recently installed tablets at many of, these, many of its restaurants. Halfway through our entrees, if any of you have been there, you might have noticed this, the tablets flash sumptuous-looking desserts, hoping to tap into our impulsive systems that will order the chocolate chip cookie sundae before our planful system kicks in to stop us. Now, a more policy-relevant and serious example is something like payday loans, where lenders offer people a cash advance against their paycheck so they can pay pressing expenses, but this loan is often accompanied by high interest rates which make the loans very difficult to pay off. Our impulsive systems can also lead us to use mental shortcuts or simplifying strategies when making a more informed decision would instead require us to wade through complicated information. One mental shortcut people use is to rely on anchors or high-profile information. An example of this that I think about a lot is college tuition. The reality is that most low-income families pay much less than the list tuition once financial aid is factored in. But what's discussed so frequently in the media is the soaring tuition rates. The fact that Harvard or Princeton or other private universities charge now $60,000 or more a year of college. Families who anchor to these media reports may incorrectly conclude college is unaffordable for them um, when in fact if they apply for financial aid, the cost that they would face would be much lower. Emotional reactions we have to a product or opportunity can also exert a strong influence on our decisions. Take this Apple ad as an example. Now, I don't really claim to be an expert on the technical specifications of smartphone cameras. Maybe the iPhone 6 really does have a technically superior camera than other phones on the market. But this ad also creates a strong association between the iPhone and adventure, beauty, and serenity. We probably don't experience these qualities directly from our iPhones, but Apple wants us to associate these sentiments with the product they want us to buy. Finally, a common reaction people have when faced with complex decisions is to simply put off making any decision at all. As a result, we experience whatever outcome occurs from sticking with the status quo. A good example of this tendency to stick with the status quo is the widely differing organ donation rates across countries. Well, most people, when told, say they would personally donate their organs in the event of death. But in countries where people have to actively fill out a form to be organ donors, the share of the population on donor registries winds up being very low. In contrast, in countries where people have to actively opt out of being donors, the share of people on the donor registry is very high. To make this really concrete, take the example of Germany and Austria, two very culturally similar countries. In Germany, people have to opt in, opt in excuse me, if they want to be on the donor registry. In Germany, only 12% of the population does so. In Austria, on the other hand, people have to opt out if they don't want to be on the registry. There, 99% of the population participates. Now, of course, even in the face of these complex behavioral responses, complex decisions still get made and complex tasks still get carefully completed. Several factors tend to lead us to invest more time into the decision-making process and to more effectively lever leverage our, our logical um, and deliberative system. One of these factors is motivation. 
we're more likely to carefully consider a decision if we believe that investing time and energy will yield positive benefits for ourselves or others. For instance, if we're expecting a tax refund, we're more likely to devote the time and energy to complete our taxes. Another factor that encourages thoughtful decision-making is urgency. When we face impending, uh, impending deadlines, like tax day on April 15th, we're again more likely to devote the time and cognitive energy and bandwidth to complete these complex tasks. And finally, the salience of a task uh, has a strong effect on, on how much energy and attention we devote to it, especially when the consequences of not completing the task are apparent and substantial, like an unwanted phone call from the IRS if we don't file our taxes by April 15th. There are also several factors that can inhibit our ability to make careful decisions. One of these factors is limited attention, especially given all the distractions we face in modern life. Another is simply having too many choices to consider. A third is adolescence. Adolescents tend to struggle with complex long-term decisions for reasons I'll elaborate on shortly. And finally, scarcity of various forms, cognitive scarcity, financial scarcity, even time scarcity, can interfere with our decision making. The first inhibitor of careful decision making is one many people on the webinar can probably relate to. Each additional ball we juggle in our lives, work, family, increasingly online activity, takes up some of our cognitive bandwidth. The more balls we're juggling, the less attention we have to devote to complex decisions, and the more likely we are to put off these decisions or use a mental shortcut to reach the decision. People also tend to put off decisions when they are faced with many choices. This is commonly referred to as choice overload. Now, the sheer volume of choices isn't necessarily an, in an inhibitor if the choices are easily comparable, like a particular style of genes that comes in different waist and inseam sizes. But with something like cold cough remedies, where each product has a different chemical composition, it's much harder to choose. So we're more likely to be swayed by something like shelf placement or product advertising rather than a careful and comprehensive assessment of which cold remedy is best for our symptoms and personal health needs. As any of us who regularly work with adolescents know, Teenagers aren't always the best at making decisions that require long-term consideration and planning. Now, there's a neurological basis for this. Adolescents' impulsive systems are firing at full cylinders, while their logical contemplative systems are really just beginning to develop. This helps explain teenagers' tendency to live in the moment and also sheds light on the helicopter parent phenomenon. As the choices adolescents face grow in complexity, for instance, where to go to college, Parents implicitly recognize that their child may not make informed decisions if left to their own devices, and so the parents step in increasingly to help out. Now, stepping back, each of the inhibitors I've discussed up until now, you could think of as a form of scarcity, attentional scarcity, cognitive scarcity, or developmental scarcity. You can think of scarcity like a tax on your cognitive bandwidth, limiting how much thought or attention you can devote to a decision. Poverty, which we'll spend much of the rest of the webinar talking about, is a particularly pernicious form of scarcity, negatively impacting people's cognitive performance and decision making. When people have to devote a greater portion of their cognitive capacity to worrying about making ends meet on a daily basis, research shows that cognitive performance suffers. And of course, people in poverty often have less room for error if the decision they make results in a negative outcome. Before we go to the next slide, I want to make a very important distinction. What I'm not saying is that people in poverty have any less cognitive ability or intelligence than more affluent people. Rather, what I'm saying is that whatever cognitive capacity each of us has as an individual, Anxieties about making ends meet financially take up a substantial portion of our cognitive bandwidth, using up mental energy and attention that we then can't devote to other tasks. To illustrate the impact that financial scarcity can have on cognitive performance, I draw on an example from the seminal and aptly titled book titled Scarcity by Sendhil Molinathan and Eldar Shafir. 
Molly Nathan and Shafir and one of their graduate students posed the following scenario to a randomly selected group of visitors to a New Jersey, to a New Jersey shopping mall. Imagine that your car has some trouble, which requires a $300 service. Your auto insurance will cover half the cost. You need to decide whether to go ahead and get the car fixed or take a chance and hope that it lasts for a while longer. How would you go about making such a decision? Mullen, Nathan, and Shafir then presented the same scenario to another randomly selected group of mall visitors, but this time the repair bill was $3,000 rather than $300. After both scenarios, the authors administered a brief cognitive performance assessment. After the first scenario, the $300 repair bill, lower and higher income people performed equally well. In both cases, $300 was not enough of a stress to alter either group's performance. After the second scenario, however, the $3,000 repair bill, the high income people performed just as well as their counterparts had the first time. But the lower income people scored substantially lower Anxiety about how they would pay for a $3,000 bill took up enough of their cognitive attention that their scores declined by the equivalent of 13 to 14 IQ points. That's about the drop you get when you, when you administer the same test to someone who stayed up all night compared to someone who got a full night's rest. In a prior conversation, Andy made a really good point. This drop in, co in cognitive performance was from a hypothetical scenario about a $3,000 bill. Imagine how cognitive performance might decline in the face of a real bill of this amount. I'd like to pause now and ask you to think for a moment about how scarcity might affect the people with whom you work. And take a moment and think about what forms of scarcity affect you in your VISTA work or affect the people that your VISTA program serves. Please enter whatever ideas you have in the chat box and make sure you send to all participants. So we have lots of different ideas about scarcity, money, food, transportation, time, um, lack of staffing resources, perhaps at the organization where they're serving, uh, no budget, um, working in a very small agency, uh, lack of education. So that could be in the people that they're serving or working with. Uh, time comes up again and again, uh, lack of skills, um, lack of expertise or experience, human capital, um, so you can see lots of different, uh, lots of different scarcities here. Yeah, great, great. Uh, thanks for pulling those out, Andy. And, and again, thanks to everyone for sharing. And I think those re those illustrate a great point. Think of every one of those examples of scarcity as again a tax on cognitive bandwidth. So I use transportation as a really concrete example. If we know every day that we've got a 10-minute walk or a 10-minute drive, we don't have to worry about traffic, um, that's not something that's going to occupy a lot of our thought or attention. We get to do the simple, pleasant walk or do a short drive, get to work, focus on tasks at hand, and then come back and then feel pretty peaceful about it. Think instead about someone who might need to take two different buses, and the buses run intermittently. If there's poor weather, they might the first bus might be running late. That means they miss the second bus connection. Those types of uh, transportation scarcity, as a concrete example, create anxiety, take up people's attention and cognitive bandwidth, and whatever energy they're putting into worrying about transportation, uh, wondering if the bus schedule is going to be on time, is then cognitive bandwidth and attention that they can't then put um, to other tasks, and it's going to reduce people's performance. So I think that's, that's a really great um, list and, and set of examples. I'd like to move on to a second question. Uh, for the type of scarcity that you share in your response to the prior question, how do you think this scarcity might affect people's decisions or behaviors? Once again, please, ident uh, please enter your ideas in the chat box and, and send them to all participants. And just as a reminder, if you're not seeing the chat window on the right-hand side, you may need to click the little chat uh, speech bubble icon, which is at the top of your screen on the right-hand side. All right, so we've got lots of ideas coming in. Um, poor decision-making, uneducated decisions, um, people feeling overwhelmed or stressed out, uh, ignoring the problem, people uh, getting fed up. 
um, and just uh, buying what you want to make you feel good. Um, thinking only in the short term, making uh, decisions that are uh, relatively short term. Um, there could be some uh, inertia, feeling uh, feeling stuck or laziness. Um, and then on the other hand, there could be some acting out behavior, emotional distress, drinking, um, or other kinds of, uh, of uh, maybe ineffective coping mechanisms. Um, ah, staying focused on the small details and missing the bigger picture. Um, things like depression, um, emotional instability. So again, a wide range here, but uh, some really significant thoughts about what the uh, the outcomes or effects could be. Yeah, these are these are really valuable insights, and I, I'm going to um, make a point myself of of viewing the the recording of this webinar, so I can I can glean some of all of your your great insights. And I think your um, your uh, a lot of the points are really well taken. And I just want to connect a couple back to um, some of the the common behavioral responses that I shared earlier. So I saw that several people wrote something like focusing on things in the short term rather than the long term. I think someone gave the example of kind of buying something that makes us feel good now, um, even if that's maybe money that we should instead save for something in the future. And, and I would tie this back to the idea between our the tension between our present and future selves. And I used the example a few times of, of wanting to exercise more, but this is true of any future goal. Maintaining attention on a future goal when it's far off requires some portion of our cognitive energy and attention, right? We need to have kind of somewhere at the top of our mind that we want to exercise more, that we want to be healthier, that we want to spend more time with our family in order to avoid our present impulses that are in conflict with those goals. Um, and, you know, the more that the fewer distractions we have uh, in our lives, as an example, or the less stress we face, I think many of us you probably can relate to the idea that we're better able to achieve those longer-term goals. The more that people experience a form of scarcity, one or another, the less of that cognitive bandwidth they can leverage. And as a result, it's harder to hold at the top of mind future goals like saving money or eating healthy um, and so the more likely we are to follow our impulses to buy something in the moment or to eat that, that extra dessert. So I think that's a, that's a really um, important example. The other one that I saw a couple different people mention is this idea of inertia. Um, again, lots of the decisions that we face, um, both, both kind of episodically, like, you know, just if, we, if it comes to a time where we need to buy a new car or a new used car, or, you know, day-to-day -day decisions that require us to evaluate um, multiple choices, what to buy at the grocery store. Um, again, the less distractions we have, the less stressed we are, the more we can access the logical, deliberative, um, careful thinking systems within our brain to make informed decisions. But the more stress we have, the more scarcity we face, the more likely we are to not have the cognitive bandwidth, not have the cognitive energy to make those careful decisions. And instead, one common response people have is to put off making a decision, to kind of exist in a moment of limbo or inertia where either no decision gets made or we just stick with the status quo. So those are all really, really great examples. Let, let's move on to the next slide if we can, Sin. So far in the presentation, I focused on behavioral barriers to and inhibitors of informed decision making. The good news is that researchers have also developed a variety of concrete strategies to help people overcome these behavioral tendencies and make informed decisions. We can do a variety of things. We can change the default conditions so people experience better outcomes if they don't make an active decision. We can promote commitment devices to help people better align their future goals with their present impulses. We can prompt people to follow through on the intentions they've set for themselves. Or we can change the way information is presented to help people make decisions that better align with their goals and circumstances. We can frame information in a way that's more likely to lead people to take action. Or we can simplify the information or choices that people face. Finally, we can reduce hassles associated with people participating in a program 
that's designed to, to support them. For the remainder of the webinar, I'm going to give concrete examples of how these strategies have been applied or could be applied to poverty reduction policies. Before I do, however, I want to make clear that I do not equate these strategies as telling people what to do or what's best for them. I personally am a strong believer in either helping people follow through on intentions they've set for themselves or in presenting information in a way that people can make informed decisions about what's best for their circumstances. In the slides that follow, I'm going to highlight four prominent challenges facing lower-income households. For each challenge, I'll then briefly discuss a few behavioral solutions that have or could be applied to address this challenge. We'll start with the challenge of helping lower wage workers accumulate more savings. As many on the webinar probably know, low wage employers are less likely to offer direct deposit to their employees. Partly owing to the fact that paychecks aren't flowing directly into bank accounts, low wage workers are also less likely to participate in the banking system. They're also more likely to use services like payday lending. The policy challenge we face then is how to encourage higher rates of saving so that lower wage families can avoid debt and have assets for investments they want to make down the road. One strategy we can use is to change the default condition. Employers, for instance, could be encouraged to at least set up direct deposit or even have the default condition be that paychecks will be direct deposited unless workers actively opt out of this and request a paper check. Direct deposited checks would help connect workers to the banking system, and at least some portion of funds that might otherwise have been spent might now remain as savings. Another default strategy was recently pioneered by the city of San Francisco. Through the kindergarten to college program, all kindergarten families in the city were automatically enrolled in a college savings account. The city made a deposit on the family's behalf and created various matching incentives to encourage families to contribute themselves. The financial deposit may ultimately be less important than the shift in the cultural status quo that occurred as a result of these interventions, where lower income families now see going to college, going to and saving for college as the path they are working towards since the start of schooling. In addition to default strategies, researchers have developed commitment devices to help people align future goals with present impulses. One example is North Carolina's Salary Advance Loan Program, or SALO, which is intended as an alternative to traditional payday loans. Workers are still borrowing against their paychecks, but a portion of the loan that they take is automatically deposited into a savings account in the worker's name to help them save for a rainy day fund down the road. Another commitment device is the Save More Tomorrow Retirement Strategy, where workers commit a portion of future pay raises to be deposited into a retirement savings account. These funds aren't reflected in the paychecks workers received after their wage increase to avoid the resentment our present selves might feel about having a portion of our raises taken away from us, so to speak. Another strategy we can use is to simply prompt people to contribute to savings accounts they've already set up. This has been done in several developing countries where account holders are sent regular text messages reminding them of their savings goals. These simple text messages which prompted people to follow through on their own intentions led to substantially higher savings rates. Another pressing policy issue we face is to improve health outcomes among low-income populations. Low-income individuals are substantially more likely to experience a variety of chronic health issues, like obesity and diabetes, and are less likely to take advantage of preventive health care opportunities. The policy challenge, therefore, is how we can encourage healthier lifestyles and use of preventive medical care. One strategy researchers have adopted is to simply change the way people encounter food. One place this has been, been applied in particular is in school cafeterias. When we change the choice architecture of an environment, we're not eliminating certain choices like chocolate milk, french fries, or candy. We're instead changing the way people encounter the choices before them. For instance, intrusively placing the salad bar so that students have to walk around it to get to other food in the cafeteria rather than having it hidden away in a corner leads to people eating more salad. 
swapping out the snack food at the register for fruit changes the impulse purchases people make when they're about to pay. When there's fruit at the register rather than Cheez-Its, kids eat more fruit. We can also take advantage of the fact that people tend to be more motivated to avoid a loss than they are to work for a potential gain. In the context of preventive medicine, this means that outreach strategies may be more effective if we communicate to people the health costs they face by neglecting medical care rather than the benefits they might realize by seeking out the same care. As an example, researchers have used these loss aversion principles to increase the share of women that obtain mammograms. Most of my own research focuses on how we can improve education for low socioeconomic status or low SES children. Low SES children experience substantial achievement gaps at every grade level. They come into, car into kindergarten already substantially behind their more affluent peers in cognitive performance on average, and on average, remain behind through high school. Low SES children are much less likely to earn post-secondary degrees. This gap has actually widened considerably over time. The policy challenge we face then is to help students access high quality school environments where they're better positioned for success. Next slide, please. Now, in an increasing number of communities, families have choices about where they send their child to school. At the elementary, middle, and high school levels, um, and in most communities, families also have choices about where they send their child for daycare and when they're quite a bit older for college. However, information about these choices is often very complicated or not very visible to families. In order to reduce the amount of cognitive bandwidth required to explore school choice options, researchers have explored a variety of strategies to simplify school choice information and proactively deliver it to families. For example, excuse me, for example, researchers at Stanford partnered with a company called Great Schools to produce school choice packets in Washington, D.C. that featured simple to understand star ratings, where you know, really well-performing schools would get five stars and less well-performing schools would get two or three stars. Rising middle schoolers who received these packets attended higher quality schools than students whose families did not receive the packets and subsequently had higher performance. The same team of researchers took a different approach to simplifying information for families. In this case, they were focused on encouraging lower income parents to practice more pre-literacy strategies with their children. Working with the city of San Francisco, the researchers enrolled parents in a text messaging campaign where several times a week they received texts with quick pre-literacy strategies they could practice at home. You can see a couple examples on the screen. So on Monday, families received a text that said, beginning word, beginning word sounds are essential for reading. You can help your child learn to read by saying the beginning sounds of words. Read starts with er. A couple days later, the students would receive another text. In this case, it said, say two words to your child that starts with the same sound, like happy and healthy. Ask, can you hear the sound in happy and healthy? Children whose parents received these texts scored substantially higher on cognitive assessments than their counterparts whose parents didn't get the text. The final policy issue we'll discuss is how to increase participation in various social programs. On their own, low-income families may lack sufficient resources to ensure adequate nutrition or access to a quality education for their children. But across various social programs, there's often a gap between the share of the population that's eligible for a program, like Pell Grants for College, and the share that actually participates. So the challenge we face in this case is how we can encourage families to participate in social programs that benefit their children. Prompt strategies can be quite effective here. In my own research, my colleagues and I have used text message reminders to encourage students to file the federal financial aid application at the end of high school, to complete required financial tasks in order to successfully matriculate in college, and to renew their financial aid once they're in college. These text campaigns cost as little as 5 or $10 per student, but can lead to substantially improved college outcomes. For instance, our text campaign to encourage college freshmen to renew their federal financial aid increased sophomore year persistence among community college students by almost 25%. 
Another approach we can take to helping people participate in social programs is to reduce hassles associated with the application process. From supplemental nutrition assistance to financial aid, people often have to complete a fairly cumbersome application in order to receive a benefit, even if much of the information needed to determine their eligibility resides in other government forms that people have already filled out, like tax returns. Steps we can take to reduce hassles, like streamlining applications, pre-populating forms with data we can draw from other sources, or helping people connect to professional advisors who can assist with the application, can all go a long way to helping families benefit from the social programs designed to support them. I've put back up on the screen the broad types of behavioral strategies we can use to help people make active and informed decisions. Stepping back for a moment, our hope through this webinar is that following today, you'll all go back and try to apply some of these strategies to your VISTA programs. To kickstart this transfer of the webinar content, I'd like to close um, the active, or my presentation portion of this session by taking a few minutes for you to think and share concrete ideas for how some of these strategies could be applied to your program. We'll leave this slide up for a couple of minutes while you brainstorm, so feel free to write down, jot down some notes to yourself, or if you're with a team of people, maybe put yourselves on mute and, and, and chat, share some ideas, um, and we'll come back together in a minute or two um, to discuss uh, your ideas. So when, when you've come up with a couple of thoughts, please use the chat function um, to share any ideas you come up with for how you could apply the behavioral strategies we discussed to your VISTA program. Um, enter your ideas in the chat box and, and make sure you send all participants. And again, we'll give you a minute or two um, to chat these ideas and then, and then read some of them out. Uh, Sam, I think we're on the next slide. Well, Ben, it looks like it hasn't taken some folks very long to come up with particular strategies that they can apply to their own VISTA projects. Um, so commitment incentives for tutoring sessions and programs um, and reducing hassles of participation, I guess, could increase the uh, rates of participation at their tutoring sessions, um, increasing visibility and representation of change. Um, on a, very practical note, uh, providing bus passes and route information to make it easier for people to get to class. A college access center in a low income part of, of town. Um, checking the reading level of information and making sure that, uh, that it's at a fourth grade reading level for folks whose literacy might not be that strong. Um, reducing hassles. Uh, bring programmer, programs closer to participants in rural areas, so to take away the travel barriers. Uh, allowing people to apply by phone. Simplifying paperwork, streamlining information and resources. Um, so, wow, there's a ton of great ideas here. And just to remind everybody, we will be uh, capturing the suggestions and ideas um, that you've all shared throughout today on the chat, and we'll make that uh, available. Um, once the recording is posted on the campus, you'll be able to see all of these. Um, wow, there's so many we can't really uh, can't really go through all of them, but um, uh, some themes are coming out. Looking at, at uh, Language and readability, uh, providing interpreting services, so that's a category there. Um, providing some financial supports, um, whether it's scholarships or making things um, free that currently aren't free. Uh, reducing barriers um, like transportation and hours and childcare and, and those kinds of, of, of issues. Um, uh, providing information on banks that have savings plans or other resources that are available that folks might not be aware of. So that's great. a quick sampling there. Yeah, so many great examples. And I, I really am I'm so excited that once this is posted to read through, because I'm sure there's lots of ideas that will inform my own work going forward. 
just call out a few examples that 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 stood out from what Andy shared. I, I, I see that someone made the point about making sure materials are are readable at the fourth grade level. And I think that actually speaks to a, I think it's a very insightful point, very well taken, and I think it speaks to a broader point about um, in any program or policy with which you're involved that you might be kind of com communicating opportunities to to clients or to members of the community, doing whatever you can to think hard about how to simplify and add kind of and, and make as visually appealing as possible that communication can go a long way. So, so I think the point about um, making sure the language itself is, is accessible at a, at a uh, relatively low reading level, um, but anything to in, improve the accessibility of print material um, is really important. And this is a lesson I draw a lot on from the private sector. So when, you know, any ad you see on a billboard in a magazine, um, there's often a very little in the way of text and a lot in the way of image and kind of banner text. Um, because, you know, private companies have known this for decades. You sell stuff um, not by requiring people to read a lot of information, but by, by um, creating maybe an emotional reaction or, or, or giving people a very simple um, and tactile uh, idea of what the product is that they, they can latch on to. And I think there are some real lessons there that we can co-opt to help um, people in poverty achieve better outcomes for themselves and their families. And so this is one of the reasons that I personally use text messaging a lot, because every single message, for a moment in time at least, appears as its own content on someone's mobile phone. And it's only 150 characters. So it's something that people can read in a quick snapshot and digest. Now, of course, sometimes it's not possible to send text messages, so instead I use letters or emails. Um, and I find that from the first draft till the last draft that actually goes out to people, I've cut about 80% of the text that I originally put in and included about 300% more images and more graphics um, to help make the information processing as simple as possible. I think the other point that this speaks to is the importance of doing a lot of prototyping. So when you're, again, developing promotional materials or applications, sign-up materials for programs or policies, before um, putting them out for the whole community, sharing them with a few um, people representative of that community to have them react and give input um, can get really, really uh, useful advice that helps you then redesign and revise materials in a way that are then more accessible as they go out. Um, another example that stood out to me is the idea of, of um, reducing hassles associated with travel uh, in rural areas. And, and that's a great example. If someone needs to drive 45 minutes or an hour to take advantage of an opportunity, they may be less likely to do so. And so I think in, in healthcare, my sense is that these the kind of mobile mammography, mobile blood donation, mobile health screening vans have been very, very important in that way where we're able to encourage people to either get preventative care or to do something like, you know, social, a socially beneficial thing, beneficial thing like donate blood by making that opportunity available on their street, in their community, rather than um, someone who has the intention of doing so putting it off because it's a hassle to get into a clinic or a hospital. Um, and then I think, you know, there's, I saw several examples around the, the financial dimension. And I, I, one particular element that I want to speak to for a moment is the, um, the salience of upfront costs, especially for people in poverty. So even if they stand to realize a long-term benefit from any particular program or opportunity, like getting a college degree, near-term costs, especially if those near-term costs aren't anticipated, can uh, derail or deter people from taking important tasks, uh, you know, following through on important tasks. So, um, in the context of, again, where a lot of my work is in education, there was great research um, showing that uh, when people take college entrance exams, they, they get their scores and they send those scores on to universities, um, and that's how universities learn about high-achieving students and, and, and kind of recruit them. Um, ACT, one of the, the college entrance exams, a few years back, uh, eliminated the fee associated with sending your score to four colleges instead of three. This is a $6 fee. So compared to the gain you get from a college degree, $6, it's not even a drop in the bucket. It's like a little bit of condensation in the bucket. Um, 
but people weren't doing it. They weren't paying to send their scores to a fourth school. When ACT eliminated this, the share of colleges to which people sent their scores went up substantially, the share of colleges to which people applied went up substantially, and the share of students that enrolled in college went up substantially. And so I think it's a nice illustration of how eliminating small upfront costs wherever possible or giving people, um, you know, small targeted um, um, money that they can use to pay for upfront costs can go a long way to helping people follow through on their intentions or take, advantages, take advantage of um, social programs. Uh, on to the next slide, Sandy. I think this is uh, – Sam, sorry. I combined Sam and Andy. Um, I think this is our my concluding slide, at least. I want to thank uh, Andy and Bethany very much for the opportunity to share this webinar with all of you and to thank Sam um, and the rest of the team on, on the back end for, for making this proceed so seamlessly. If you'd like to learn more about uh, any of the, the work um, that I've described, particularly around um, – Education, I have two books on applying behavioral insights to education. The first is an edited volume of essays that came out in April. And the second is a new book I have coming out in October on behavioral economics and education. Um, I also just want to mention I didn't have room on the slides to, to put these on here, but I think for kind of broader views or broader discussions of how behavioral economics um, can be applied to policy or to reduce poverty. And these are books, I, you know, I, my work is really standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, great books that you might want to consult. One is called Nudge by Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein. Another great book on, on kind of how we approach complex decisions, uh, really the, the pioneer of this, of this kind of system one, system two thinking, um, is Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. And then a, a brand new book on, on kind of the making of behavioral economics is called Misbehaving by Richard Thaler. Um, I also have put up my email address and, and, and my Twitter handle. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out to me directly if you have questions. Um, and I just want to thank you all for being here and, again, to Andy and Bethany for the chance to participate. Great. Well, thank you so much, Ben. Um, and thanks, everyone, for participating. We're not done yet, not by a long shot. Um, we want to get to your questions. You'll notice that Sam has just opened up an evaluation poll on the right side of the screen. Um, we'd love to get your feedback and ideas about how we can make these sessions better, um, you know, how we did today, um, what worked, what didn't. Uh, and then if you have ideas for other topics that we could present in future webinars, um, Please take a moment to, to share those ideas there on the right. Uh, you'll notice that when the poll opened, um, some of the other windows collapsed. Um, so if you want to ask a question, um, now is the time to do that. So I'm going to um, give you a little bit of a briefing here. Um, just above the poll on the right side is the Q&A block. Uh, you'll need to click the little triangle next to Q&A to open it up so that you can enter your question in. Um, and then we also have the option, if you've dialed in uh, by phone, you can ask a question verbally. And I'm going to ask Jenny, our operator, to come back and give us those instructions for asking on the phone. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question over the phone, please press star 1. Please unmute your phone and record your name clearly when prompted. To withdraw your request, you may press star 2. All right, and while we're waiting for questions to come in over the phone, um, I'll start with some of the ones that have already come in. Uh, so Sarah asks, and, and Ben, this goes back to when you were talking about uh, prompts and the, the example um, in uh, countries where they were using text messages to encourage or remind people to save. So Sarah asks, what are the specific percentages of people who saved um, in that study of uh, sending the text messages? That's a great question. I do not have the, the percentages um, off the top of my head. The study is by um, a Yale behavioral economist named Dean Carlin, um, K-A-R-L-A-N, uh, and it's a paper from 2010. Uh, I think if you Google Carlin 2010 text messages, uh, financial savings, it would probably come up. I think it's called something like getting to the top of mind. Um, so I hope that is helpful. And in that paper, they report the particular percentage increases. Great. Thank you for that. And, uh, in fact, I suppose I can um, – the, the irony is that even though I do a lot of work with um, 
technology. I'm, I'm rather a, a, a technological dinosaur myself, so I'm going to try my best to post a link to the paper into the chat uh, field. Okay, great. And we can always um, share that afterwards as well um, if that doesn't come up right away. Um, sort of a follow-up question to that um, from Rayanne. Uh, she says, many low-income families have limited minutes or text plans on their phones. Um, any other suggestions for prompting within the, the low-income uh, communities? Uh, tremendous question. Um, I, I, so I, my first texting project was in 2012, and so we're now you know, three years past that. And what I have personally seen is that um, – the share of low-income students and families who have unlimited texting plans has risen quite uh, dramatically. So I certainly agree with you that it's a concern for some families, but I think it's a smaller share. The other thing I would say is that, um, and this is important for, for VISTA programs to know if you're considering texting, um, based on new FCC guidelines uh, issued in October 2013, in order to send to someone a text message, you obviously need their cell number, but you also need active consent to text them for a specific purpose. So when I text people about financial aid, um, I might do something like embed a cell phone field on a financial aid application or a college application, and we'll include a little language saying, uh, we'd like to send you a small number of text messages with useful financial aid information, um, standard message rates apply, that kind of thing. Um, we tend to find quite a um, high rate of students or families taking up the opportunity to provide their cell number. So when we invite people to, to provide a number, um, you know, anywhere in the range of 50 to 80, 90 percent of people provide numbers. And across all of the texting campaigns that I've done, fewer than uh, 5 percent of recipients opt out of receiving the text. Um, and so what I think, what I take that as an indication of is that people at, at the worst see these as neutral, and in many cases, I think, by response rates that we observe, find them quite beneficial, but there's very, very few people who are opting out, and I, I think if the messages were, were generating what felt to be burdensome out-of-pocket costs, um, then people would vote with their feet and, and not stay in the campaign. Um, you know, that, that being said, there are certainly some communities in which it might be hard to collect cell phone numbers, um, and I think, I think there are other viable means, like postal mail, like email. Certainly, I think there's lots of opportunity uh, on the frontier of, of different social media um, to communicate with people. And so my, my overriding view is, is less about texting, because um, I think people are always going to change in how they are communicating, and more uh, trying to be at the frontier of how people communicate and meeting them where they are. Just the final thing I'll say, and we can move on to another question, of course, um, is that you know, based on Pew-centered data, this is how I, I really got started on texting, um, something like 65, 70, I think now upwards of 75% of young people report that they text with each other on a daily basis. That compares to 3% that say they email. Um, and so that's, you know, largely informed my, my shift to using text as a means of delivering information. All right, great. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Emily asks, uh, a lot of the inhibitors discussed result in stress. Are there things that people can do, such as meditation or exercise, to reduce their stress and therefore better approach complex decisions, even if those inhibitors still exist? That's a wonderful question. Um, and, you know, a bit out of my area of, of expertise or experience, but I would think, you know, on a, on a kind of logical level, I think it's a tremendous suggestion. I've got a colleague um, who, who you might want to you know, look up or read about um, named Phil Oriopoulos at the University of Toronto, really, really um, a smart, um, uh, accomplished behavioral economist uh, who's doing work focused on promoting stress reduction activities in parents um, to see how that then affects their, their children's education outcomes. Um, this is with work with Ariel Khalil, who's a developmental psychologist at the University of Chicago. Um, so I think there's, there's lots of interest in this, in, in kind of recognizing that people in general, people in poverty in particular, um, are experiencing stress and trying to directly help them reduce that stress um, for a variety of health reasons, of course, but one benefit of that is that it might free up 
cognitive bandwidth they can then focus on on uh, the decisions they face. So it's a, it's a tremendous question. Great. Now, uh, Jenny, let's go to the phones. Do we have any questions lined up there? There are no questions over the phone at this time. Okay, great. Well, just to remind everyone, if you want to ask a question through the WebEx, uh, click the little question mark icon at the top right of your screen. The Q&A block will open. Uh, submit your question there. If you're on the phone, you would dial star one, um, record your name at the prompt, and then Jenny will line up your question. Um, all right, so here we go. Uh, so Emery has a question um, that uh, is a little technical, maybe beyond mine. She says, uh, can you answer a question about the amygdala and prefrontal cortex? I'm wondering about connections with other information I've learned and would really appreciate the specifics if that's something you can offer. Um, it's a great question. I, I, um, it's a, again a bit beyond my area of expertise. Um, the the people um, who who I think are, I mean, this is obviously a, a variety. This is a, a really hot area for neuroscience research. Um, but as it relates to behavioral economics and decision making, um, the person who I would, I would, whose page I would. Um, uh, spent some time looking around at David Labson at Harvard, L-A-I-B-S-O-N. Um, he's partnered very actively with a group of neuroscientists to understand um, how different aspects of, of people's cognitive development and, and different neurological regions affect decision-making. I think there's a, a neurologist by the name of, of Bruce McClure with whom uh, David Lapson has collaborated. So I apologize that I'm not able to, to provide the scientific details, but um, that's where, where I would start for, for learning more. All right, thanks. Um, Elizabeth asks, what do you think are good strategies to meet people where they are when talking about the future, for example, saving or investing or tax returns? Um, so that's a really that's a really interesting question. You know, I, I think that as a starting point, and this gets gets back to a point I made about uh, believing strongly in not telling people what they should do, but trying to understand people's own intentions. Uh, and so I think that would be my own starting point. So for any of those um, dimensions, let's say financial savings, um, trying to understand what their goals are for themselves and for their families. And then from there, I think my, um, my attempt would be to um, develop some behaviorally appropriate strategies to support those intentions. So a couple ideas, like I might have mentioned this in the slides, but, but to reiterate them, a couple ideas that come to mind are, one, trying to help people set up um, some some kind of default behaviors and so that they don't have to think about saving week to week, month to month when kind of present needs, present impulses might get in the way. Um, if they don't have direct deposit, setting up direct deposit. If they um, don't, you know, maybe if they do have a checking account but not a savings account, helping them think about setting up a savings account and having an automatic uh, monthly deduction from their checking account that goes directly into their savings account. Um, the Save More Tomorrow Retirement Savings uh, Program example that I shared was really interesting in design. This was in a company where people could anticipate with some certainty getting a raise on a regular basis, you know, 3% uh, raise, let's say, every 18 months or something. Um, and this was designed so that workers at the, at the company could opt into dedicating a portion of their increase to go to retirement savings. So if in 18 months I know my salary is going to go up 3%, I can say, well, I want 1% of that 3% raise um, to go to, to retirement. The other 2% I'll, I'll keep. Um, and so that's another thing you could, you could think about people doing if they know in advance that they're going to be getting a raise at some point or they anticipate they are, um, helping them make a commitment now rather than when the raise um, occurs to dedicate a portion of that to savings or, or another need. Um, in general, I would be thinking, to broaden out a bit, I'd be thinking about, you know, how do I help people state or understand what their own intentions are, and what are ways that I can help people commit themselves to attaining those goals, recognizing that when the present arrives, all of us tend to struggle um, uh, in the face of present impulses or needs to, to follow through on those intentions. All right, great. 
Uh, Jenny, I want to check to see if we have any questions on the phone. Yes, we do. From Andrea. Ma'am, your line is open. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if there were any additional findings um, regarding your study on behavioral economics within the Spanish-speaking or migrant communities around the country. Um, if um, any of your finding, if there are any resources that might be available to help um, facilitate um, the, these, this study or um, some sort of um, work within these communities um, to help uh, give them access to resources. Yeah, um, great question, Andrea. So in our in the section work that I've done, um, one of the places we did a texting campaign was in Dallas, uh, where we were cognizant that, that – and this was a text campaign, actually, where we were sending messages to students and families – and parents, excuse me. Um, we were conscious that for some share of parents in the community, Spanish would be their preferred language, not, not English. And so what we did is we had an introductory message that would go out. Um, offering, letting people know we'd be sending them a series of texts about college and offering one-on-one -on -one help. We immediately followed that with the same message translated in Spanish and asked people to just reply Espanol if they wanted to get the same series of text messages that would go forward, but to receive them in Spanish. Um, and and, and you know, lots of parents took us up on that. And so one of the really nice things about, about a text campaign is that you know, what we can do and the way we can customize it to um, our populations is only limited by our kind of creativity and forethought. So if we're doing a text campaign around um, school attendance or pre-literacy strategies or college going, um, and there's, let's say, three dominant, four dominant languages in our community, we can, trans we can write, uh, you know, for me, I would start writing the, you know, the text campaign out in English and then work with someone who could help me translate that into those three or four other dominant languages. All of that gets loaded into the text system and then when we, you know, send our introductory message, we could say, reply if you want this in Spanish, uh, Chinese, or, or Russian, let's say, and then, and then the messages go out. So I think that's one of the kind of nimbleness, um, one of the advantages of texting is how nimble it is. To your question about the migrant populations, um, I, I think it's a tremendous question. I know um, from from some work I'm doing with, with folks at the White House and the Department of Education, um, this is an active area of interest through the Office of Migrant Education, um, particularly the question of whether we could either leverage tablet or smartphone technology. My, um, children in migrant families already have or provide them with that technology to um, help um, connect them to educational resources uh, and or professional assistance as they are moving to different parts of the country. So specific to that population, this is an area that um, in which there is a great deal of active focus right now, and, and I'm happy um, through, through Andy or Bethany to, to keep the VISTA community updated as that work proceeds. Well, sounds like lots of innovation going on out there, particularly around the technology piece. Um, do we have others on the phone? There are no other questions over the phone at this time. Okay, well, we've got plenty of other questions here. Courtney asks, how vital or practical is it for communities to start a cohort with a getting ahead concept when they live in a just getting by world? Oh, that's a great question. Um, So I, I think it's a it's it's a, I, it, I think it feels a bit hard to answer it in general uh, without without knowing some of the specific details of the community. Um, you know, certainly in a hierarchy of needs, of course, we need to help communities attend to their basic um, safety and, and nutrition and, and kind of family well-being. I guess the question I would ask is. Um, and of course, we always have fewer resources to support our, our social objectives. And, um, um, than we than we would benefit from. Um, this, I think the way I would think about it is whether, um, and I, I apologize, I don't remember the exact phrasing, but whether by virtue of helping put in place strategies um, to help people get ahead, um, we might marginally uh, over time make it easier to get by. And again, I, I apologize that my answer is rather vague, um, but 
but I guess th- that's at least how I would be inclined to think about it. And and actually, the only thing I I would add is I would in all of my work, and certainly I think in this case, I'd be inclined to start with members of the community themselves and ask where they aspire to be, even if it's two weeks or two months down the road rather than two years, and then to figure out what strategies or supports I might help be able to help put in place um, to keep those two-week or two-month objectives at the top of mind, even when there is a host of, of present challenges that make it difficult to focus make it difficult to focus beyond the moment. Okay, great. Uh, next up, Brandy asks, uh, what are some ways to incentivize parents to participate in after-school hours or weekend events? That's a, that's a great question. And, you know, I think I've thought a lot and continue to think a lot about parent involvement. Um, and, you know, I guess from – I'll really pose it as a question for the group and love people's thoughts on this. I'm curious how much of it is an incentive issue. And usually I think of incentives as, um, you know, people uh, when weighing different options, one of them being participating in an after school program um, against other options or choosing the other options because they are, you know, a little bit more attractive to them, whatever those, or a little bit more necessary for them, however we might think about it. And that giving a financial incentive um, helps people readjust that calculation so that now they feel they can participate in aftercare programs or after school programs. That's certainly one possible explanation and one that I think is worth um, uh, exploring. I also wonder, though, in many communities, and I, I should have said that, so I mentioned I was an AmeriCorps member. Um, I was also a high school teacher and a school administrator for about a decade in Providence. And I know that one of the things we wrestled with, and my sense is that schools in general wrestle with, is just how to effectively communicate with and engage parents. So we would do things like FAFSA completion nights at our school, where we would we would have counselors standing by to help parents and they're, help families fill out the FAFSA and be really hard to get parents to come. Um, and I think that was for a host of reasons. I think the way we communicated about it didn't always reach parents. Um, I think some of our parents just didn't have a trusting relationship with the school, um, or it was a hassle and they couldn't get to the school. And so on the dimension of parent involvement, I'm, I am personally more inclined to start on those um, with those strategies of, about getting parents involved, so better communication, um, better trust building, uh, reducing hassles. And one of the things I've been thinking about is is what are the best avenues to communicate with parents of the children, um, of the kind of target children, child population. Going through schools is certainly something we should continue to do better at. I just frankly think schools struggle with this a lot. And so are there other communities like um, – labor unions or faith-based communities or large employers that have strong communications infrastructures, in some cases have strong trust from their, from their employees, um, through whom we could be better communicating with parents about ways to get involved with their children. So that's how I think about the, the parent involvement um, question, um, but that's not to say that financial incentives might not also be an effective strategy to explore. Great. Uh, we do have a few more questions in about eight or nine minutes left, so we'll see how many of these we can get to, and I'll apologize in advance if we don't get to your question. Uh, so Sarah asks, do you have any examples of how you or maybe others have reframed social programs to better serve the community? Um, yeah, so so I think um, one of my, and, and I, I will admit, most of my examples um, draw from education because that, that's where a lot of my research is. But my hope is that they are kind of illustrative examples that, that those of you who are working in other domains feel you can, can apply to those domains. Um, so, you know, one of the questions, again, I think about a lot is for various social programs that are designed to support communities, um, we rely on people knowing about them and sometimes applying for them in order to participate. And so something I think about is how do we get better visibility around programs? How do we help people with application programs or applications that, that are necessary if they're going to engage in this, in this program that's designed to support them or their community? One of my favorite examples is work done by my um, 
advisor and, and mentor, Bridget Terry Long and, and um, her colleagues, uh, Eric Bettinger and Phil Oyopoulos, um, where they were trying to promote higher rates of completion of the federal financial aid application. And just to give you some context, um, about 10% of students in college who who would be eligible for need-based financial aid don't apply. And so there's been a lot of efforts to increase FAFSA completion rates. What they did, which I thought was really brilliant, is they worked with H&R Block, um, one of the largest providers of tax preparation assistance for, for lower-income communities, to design a very, very simple kind of computer-based um, financial aid application completion supplement to the tax return process. So families would come in in March, April to do their taxes. They'd complete their taxes, and at the end of it, the tax professional would say, hey, do you want to take 10 minutes to – or do you have a kid who's about to go to college or of college age? Do you want to take 10 minutes to help that student apply for financial aid? Families said yes. Um, the tax professional would walk them through a few additional questions that weren't captured for the information provided in their taxes, print out the, FAF, the financial aid application, and the family would send it in. That 10, minute, 10 minutes of additional time to help families apply for financial aid increased um, college going by about 30%. Um, and so I think that's one example uh, of how we can um, think creatively about supporting families um, to apply for a social program, in this case, by meeting them where they're at. They're at the income tax preparation site with all the information to complete the FAFSA. So let's have, let's work with the tax professionals to do the financial application right then and there. Great, lots of good information. Uh, Channing asks, do you think that peer pressure has an impact on people living in poverty? Yes, I think that's a tremendous question, uh, an insightful question, and one that I, I didn't really speak to, um, but I, I think is nonetheless very important. Um, you know, we know from quite a bit of research that especially in, um, in times or in experiences of uncertainty, um, that people are very, very influenced by peer norms or social norms. Um, and we tend to um, be most influenced by the norms of, of groups that we think are similar to ourselves, so age, gender, race, or ethnicity. Um, and so I think there's a lot of, of decision-making, or, or lack of decision-making perhaps, that is strongly influenced or even directed by what people perceive as the norm of their peer group. Um, and so anything we can do to create uh, or to change a sense of, of what the uh, – or to create a positive social norm around a, a social program can have a lot of benefits. Um, there's been work done on this, for instance, in, in um, tax filing that simply sending people letters that report the share of people in their community that pay their taxes on time increases um, tax compliance or, or giving people information about how their – energy use compares to their neighbors reduces home energy consumption. On the, on the margin of kind of helping underrepresented students succeed in college, um, having um, underrepresented students participate in panels of upperclassmen where those panels talk about how their first year in college was maybe a bit of a struggle, but that that struggle is a normal part of the transition and that it gets easier over time and people build a sense of community. The opportunity to participate in that kind of panel substantially increases um, college persistence and success rate. So I think across lots of different dimensions, um, fairly low-cost targeted efforts to reframe people's perceptions of the norm and to promote a positive social norm that aligns with a desired behavior or outcome um, can go a long way towards, towards, um, towards reframing how people think about opportunities or experiences. Great. So letting them know that they're not uh, unusual in, in facing what they're going through and, uh, and that they'll be able to make it. Uh, I think we have time for one last question. This one comes from Anne. Uh, and she says, what are some other ways to reduce hassles and barriers so that we can encourage people to sign up for SNAP benefits? SNAP, of course, being food stamps or supplemental yep. nutrition assistance program. Well, so, you know, I, I think that, that some of the, the primary efforts at, um, in, at reducing hassles are, you know, I guess one could categorize in a, in a few general ways. I think meeting people where they are, um, you know, I use the example of income tax preparation, and, and I, don't, um, I don't claim expertise or a lot of experience in, in thinking about how to enroll families 
um, and supplemental nutritional assistance. But I'd be thinking about where is the population that I'm trying to sign up for this um, spending their time anyways, and where how might I kind of literally meet them there and, and, and help them go through this application process. I might think about if, if I had latitude in doing this, I might think about ways to simplify the application. Now, my guess is as a, as a federal program, there's constraints on what one can do, but perhaps some of the application can be pre-populated with, with data that exists or easily, easily obtained data, so it takes families less time. I think making one-on-one um, -on -one help available, so whether that's paid staff or, you know, perhaps members of a faith-based community who are willing in a volunteer basis to help people fill out their application um, is another way of, of reducing the hassle associated with accessing these benefits. Um, and finally, you know, doing, uh, promote, this may be a, an opportunity um, to promote a positive social norm, so giving people a sense of perhaps how many other people in their community are taking advantage of this resource. I think as a you know closing thought, I know we're we're running out of time, um, and, and I do want to reiterate: please don't hesitate uh, to email me or, or get in touch if, if I can answer follow-up questions. Um, but I, at a you know I think at the broadest level, what I would say is don't be shy about trying out some of these behavioral strategies. Um, oftentimes they're low cost, and and in a good way they're low touch. That we're we are often you know. Um, not putting people at, at much risk by giving them some information or giving them some prompts. Um, however, if you are encouraged or excited to try something out, I, I want to emphasize two things. One, the details really, really matter. Um, so the details of what we communicate, how we communicate, the kinds of help we provide people. And so really thinking through the details of any of these strategies and getting lots of different input um, from um, from people in your program, people in related programs, academics like me who think about these issues. Um, and then, and then do as much prototyping as you can before, you know, pushing out these types of strategies to, to your target population. Um, because, you know, focal members of the groups we're trying to support always give the best feedback about the relevance and authenticity of these strategies and the, and the materials we develop. So, um, I guess those, that's what I would offer as, as some, some parting suggestions, but again, happy to continue the discussion offline. Great. Well, Ben, I want to thank you so much for all the terrific information that you've shared today. And also I want to thank all of our participants for all of the thoughtful ideas, questions, and resources that have been shared. Just as a reminder to everyone, we will be sharing um, all of the, uh, the chat suggestions, ideas, um, that you all have contributed. Um, we'll post those on the VISTA campus along with a video recording of today's webinar and a set of the slides if you want to download those later. Um, we also had a few questions for folks who are interested in additional resources, reading materials, and links, so we'll post those uh, as well. Um, I do want to invite you all uh, to come back for another webinar in just over two weeks. Um, we've got one on winning, uh, sorry, writing winning grant proposals. Um, we'll have with us an experienced grant reviewer who is going to give us advice from his perspective and experience in looking at some really good and some really awful uh, uh, grant proposals. So um, we invite you to come back. If you have any questions, you can reach us on uh, through email at vistawebinars at cns.gov. And again, thank you all for joining us today.